Hello and welcome to online lecture two on freedom of religion, uh, the free exercise clause. So it is my goal in this uh, short online lecture to do two things. One is to start off by talking about what religion is in terms of the First Amendment, generally speaking, and then uh, give you the parameters of the free exercise clause. I hope uh, that some of this discussion uh, that I'm about to, to delve into here gives you questions, and I want you to write down those questions and bring them with you to class uh, the next time we meet. Um, it, if it doesn't give you questions, you haven't been listening because it's, it's kind of all over the place. Um, so with that, I will try and keep this as short as possible, let the readings speak for themselves, and fill in where I can. Uh, what is protected under the First Amendment, uh, e either in terms of free exercise or establishment clause with regard to religion, really depends on how religion is defined. Um, and because religion is not defined within the Constitution itself, that definition has changed over time. Uh, so we have early definitions. The Reynolds case was uh, a case about polygamy in Utah, and we're going to touch on that in a couple of slides a little more in depth, uh, but the Supreme Court actually kind of proposed a test for religion that sounded a lot like if it was around when the Constitution was written, if the religious belief was around when the Constitution was written, it was per se um, uh, accepted so that you kind of got a free pass, and if it wasn't, then it was suspect at best. Uh, the Davis versus Beeson case is a case that involves uh, a, a, a sort of nuanced test. It's a little more nuanced than Reynolds, and it says that uh, religion is some sort of relationship between oneself and one's creator. Uh, fast forward about 50 years uh, plus, and we start to loosen this up, realizing that our definitions of religion as they stood didn't seem to really uh, encompass everything that could possibly be considered religion and were perhaps too rigid. So we have U.S. versus Ballard, uh, which says that we shouldn't test the truth of the uh, religious belief. In other words, you're not going to uh, test the truths in Catholicism or in Judaism or in Islam or in Buddhism, but instead uh, you're going to test the sincerity of the belief on the part of the believer so that you can't expect tests to, to or truths to withstand uh, scientific or legal scrutiny, but what you can look at is the sincerity with which the person believes them. Uh, and the U.S. versus Seeger case pushed back uh, even further on this kind of early definition and said that it's some sort of relationship to a supreme being uh, that occupies the place religion would. Uh, so as long as it is occupying a place in your life that religion would, it doesn't have to be a traditional notion of God, a traditional, uh, you know, monotheistic, Judeo-Christian belief in God. So generally speaking, what we have now is uh, an understanding that the general rule is you, a religious belief is something that is deeply held. It's not something you develop overnight, but something you hold as one of your core principles. Uh, it's either a belief in a religious principle or a belief that takes the place of a religious principle, and that uh, courts don't look into the truth of the underlying um, belief. So they only look at the sincerity with which you hold it. But uh, this is still a definition that is changing. Um, and sometimes, depending on the court and depending on the situation, it's broader than others. And so with these cases that we see and with any case exercise, one thing we have to understand is that it really depends on the situation whether the court is willing to uh, perceive something as a religious belief or not. So when we're talking about free exercise, uh, well, first, when we're talking about the religious portion of the First Amendment, it's this first uh, bold part here. Congress shall make no law 
respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And the prohibiting the free exercise thereof is the clause we're talking about today. Um, so what does this mean? You know, to really just boil it down to brass tacks, you cannot interfere with someone's uh, practice of their religion. But what is the practice of their religion? And when can the government interfere? If you say part of your religious beliefs is committing human sacrifice, does the government have to stand by and allow you to do that? Um, and so really, we have to start thinking about religion, not just in terms of beliefs, but in terms of activities. And so if you think about uh, perhaps your own religious upbringing or one that you're familiar with, uh, it's not necessarily one of just a set of beliefs, but a set of actions. Uh, and you might not recognize them as actions because they're so ingrained in you. But uh, even if you think about a traditional church service uh, or Catholic mass, there are several actions within that that constitute uh, participating in mass. Um, and so the government is concerned with when it can and cannot restrict activities. Um, it's not necessarily concerned with whether or not it can restrict beliefs. Um, in fact, this prohibits it from doing so. So our cases are going to hinge on activities or practices, not beliefs. So early developments. The Reynolds case is one that I mentioned earlier. And the Reynolds case has to do with uh, a congressional law that outlawed polygamy in the Utah Territory, um, and the federal uh, Congress could do that at the time because it was a territory, not a state. And really, it, in reality, it was done just as a way to persecute Mormons. It wasn't done um, kind of as like a blanket underlying policy concern, but really just to persecute the Mormons uh, because they didn't believe the Mormons were worthy of protection. So the issue was whether congressional law criminalizing polygamy was a violation of the Free Exercise Clause. So the, the Supreme Court had to grapple with this question, and they said that Congress was perfectly fine in instituting this law. And the reason why it was fine is because they drew a line between behaviors and beliefs, uh, and that there was protected behaviors and non-protected behaviors. And so... What they said is that when people act, government may have a valid, neutral policy reason to prohibit that action. Just because that action is tied to a religious belief doesn't mean Congress or any state legislature later would have to allow it to happen. So we move on to the Pierce case. And the Pierce case uh, is interesting because it's almost flipping this a little bit. Um, and in the Pierce case, uh, they sort of ignored Reynolds and said that a state law that said that Catholic school, K through 12 type school, was not an acceptable substitute for public education. Uh, they said that that law was unconstitutional because it violated free exercise rights. So we have in Reynolds' case the uh, kind of shooting down of free exercise rights uh, in, in activity, but in the Pierce case we have the upholding of free exercise rights um, and with regard to compulsory school attendance for minors. Um, and the reason they did this is not because they distinguished some sort of legal test, but simply because they said, yeah, but what the sister, Society of Sisters uh, are, is doing is meritorious. And so uh, it's useful, and we should allow them to continue. And this law shouldn't prohibit that from happening. It was a complete, uh, ig ig you know, it, it was a complete piece of ignorance in terms of whether they respected precedent or not. Now, Cantwell uh, is one of our bigger cases in the book, and Cantwell delves into two issues, the first of which uh, we should probably pause, uh, this is going to happen throughout the semester, has to do with whether or not uh, the free exercise set clause is applicable to the states. After the adoption of the 14th Amendment, uh, it was not clear 
whether the Bill of Rights applied to the state laws and state legislators and state actors along with Congress. It was clear that all of these things apply to the federal, but when the 14th Amendment came in and said everybody has equal protection of the laws and this now applies to states, does that mean they have to adhere to the Bill of Rights as well? So in each of these sections we will be studying, we will see uh, cases like this, uh, like the Miranda case uh, later in Map versus Ohio about searches, uh, that determine whether or not a portion of the Bill of Rights applies to the states. So that's the first issue Cantwell has to deal with, uh, is, is selective incorporation. The second issue, and the real substantive issue, is whether a government actor can uh, assess exemptions for religious activities. So what was going on here is that the uh, state of Connecticut was requiring people who were going door to door to solicit funds to apply for a permit to do so. And uh, the person determining whether something was a religious solicitation or not uh, for, for purposes of the permit or being exempt from the permit or what have you was in fact a government actor. And what Cantwell argued is that a government actor should not be the one determining whether something is a religious activity or not. Uh, and the Supreme Court agreed. The Supreme Court said it violated the Free Exercise Clause to put a governmental actor in charge of determining what was religious solicitation versus non-religious solicitation uh, and allowing uh, denial for an exemption based on that fact. So what Cantwell stands for is that you cannot put a government actor in charge of determining what a religious uh, activity is. Now Cantwell uh, still holds in some regard. You have uh, the ability of uh, Cantwell to apply to Pledge of Allegiance, but in the Pledge of Allegiance case, uh, the Gobitis case, it didn't uh, hold up quite as well. When we get to free speech, we'll talk about that a bit more. Uh, so that's really where our law stands at for a period of time. Until we get to the Sherbert and Yoder cases. Uh, so what we are looking at here is, is, is the government in the court is searching for something more than it's a belief, it's protected, it's an activity, it's not. Because that really doesn't uh, speak to most religious activities. Most religious activities are not just sitting around thinking about something. There is some form of action involved. Uh, in the Braunfeld case, uh, which is a precursor to the Sherbert and Yoder case, uh, the uh, local uh, jurisdiction had what was called at the time blue laws that required businesses to close on Sunday um, and saying that their compelling state action to do this was uh, the upholding of a day of rest, that there was a public policy reason to have a day of rest and that these blue laws um, protected that. But uh, a Jew challenged this, a Jewish store owner challenged this law. Because Sunday is not the day of rest for Jewish people, uh, at least in religious terms, this uh, shop owner had to not only close his shop on Saturday because of his religious beliefs, but also on Sunday uh, because of the law. And what he argued is that this blue law was really enforcing a different religious belief upon him and not allowing him to exercise his religion freely. Um, and the court uh, pretty much shot him down. And it said that as long as a state is regulating conduct uh, in general terms and that it is something within its power, and this for a long time was determined to be within the powers of a state and still to many degrees is. It's why you can't sell alcohol before or after a certain time. That's within state law. As long as the state has a secular uh, purpose and it is a, a compelling purpose, uh, there's no burden involved, and therefore the shop owner was out of luck. Two years later, though, uh, we have a little bit of a different court and a different situation. In Sherbert versus Verner, which is one of the larger cases in our book, the issue is whether uh, 
uh, the state could deny unemployment benefits to someone who refused work that required her to work on a Saturday. So uh, Ms. Sherbert was a Seventh-day Adventist who, uh, like Jewish people, have sa Saturday as the Sabbath, and she could not work on Saturday. She had one job, uh, that uh, she held for many years, and then all of a sudden the job changed to require her to work on Saturday. She uh, refused and got fired from the job and started to collect unemployment or applied for unemployment. Uh, but they also uh, said it wasn't just that she got denied or unemployment right off the bat because of her refusal to work Saturdays. It was that she was offered other work that also required her to work Saturday. Uh, and she refused that work based on the fact that she could not work on Saturdays. And so really it's kind of a dual question. One is whether this is imposing on her religious beliefs. And the court said it actually was, uh, that requiring her to work on Saturdays when Saturdays um, are supposed to be a day of rest uh, for her religious uh, beliefs and practices, that was a burden. And secondly, even though uh, this is not something you are entitled to as a matter of right, it's a benefit. Unemployment benefits have the term benefit in them because they're a benefit. Um, but uh, even though this is a benefit and she is applying for a benefit, and there are many reasons you can get denied for a benefit, one of those reasons cannot be because you are trying to practice your religion. Um, and so even though it is a benefit and not a right, it has to be provided without discrimination based on religion. It cannot infringe on someone's free exercise. Uh, and so there was no compelling state interest that justified the infringement here. And the Supreme Court said that, in fact, Ms. Sherbert was entitled to uh, her unemployment benefits. The next uh, case in this test that is developing what we're going to be calling the compelling interest test, that the government must have a compelling interest to do something. Uh, the next part is Wisconsin versus Yoder. And Wisconsin versus Yoder has to do with uh, another compulsory education law, saying that everybody under the age of 16, uh, after age 5, between 5 and 16, has to be in school uh, so many hours out of the year and, and so forth. We have these laws today. Um, and they vary from state to state. Wisconsin tried to implement a law that did not recognize that uh, Mennonites and Amish take their children out of school at the age of 13, out of public school, so they would have them be uh, schooled at a public school until age 13. Then they take them out of school and continue their education at home, usually in vocational ways, but also in uh, biblical terms and some other education as well. And so these parents that were taking their kids out of school at the age of 13 when this new law was implemented were being fined for not having their kids in school. These were essentially truancy fines being applied to the parents. Uh, and so the court had to grapple with the question of whether this was a neutral state law um, and they found that it was but they also found that there was no compelling interest to force uh, children that would otherwise be exempt to attend public school or even a private school uh, that met certain qualifications when they are getting other education that suited their needs at home. So what Wisconsin versus Yoder and the Sherbert case stand for is that government must have a compelling interest to infringe on someone's religious practices and that that compelling interest has to be to further a neutral government policy purpose. Otherwise, it's a violation of the Free Exercise Clause. Running contrary to that is the Bob Jones case. Uh, Bob Jones University uh, is a notoriously uh, conservative university, and what they were trying to claim is that they were exempt from certain requirements that uh, you have as a university that accepts federal dollars in, in the form of federal financial student aid. Um, so they were claiming they were exempt primarily from things like affirmative action, 
and uh, sexual harassment policies and, and so forth. And the Supreme Court said that they were not, that this was not uh, something that uh, the federal government took lightly. This was definitely meeting that compelling interest test. So Sherbert and Yoder are not exactly bad law, but they're not exactly good law either. They're not really the gold standard in terms of free exercise. And what we're going to go into in the next couple of slides here is where the test stands today. And we're going to end up on the front door of the Hobby Lobby case, which is uh, what the diversion immersion case study is uh, written based on. Uh, so in U.S. versus Lee, we start to see people challenging neutral laws um, based on religious beliefs, uh, even after the Sherbert Yoder um, test comes out. So U.S. versus Lee, an Amish shop owner refused to withhold Social Security taxes or pay the employer's share. Uh, saying that this was uh, against his religious beliefs, but the court said this was not something protected by the Free Exercise Clause, that if you choose to employ people, you choose to follow the federal and state laws uh, required for employers. Uh, we also have Goldman versus Weinberger, which is a case involving military dress, and it was whether you could wear a yarmulke in the military, uh, and the court said military is completely different. Uh, we're not talking about civil civilian society here. We're talking about military. There's different rules, especially with regard to dress. Um, so if the military says no, um, and there's a reason to say no, uh, that they could uh, prohibit certain religious garb. Now, what's interesting is that Congress actually enacted a law that uh, that went against the court's ruling. So they essentially overturned uh, the court's ruling in the Goldman case uh, with a new piece of legislation. Which brings us to a very famous case, uh, not too far in the past, Employment Division, uh, Department of Human Resources of Oregon versus Smith, otherwise uh, known and better known as the Peyote case. This is the case that set off the Religious Freedom Restoration Act craze. That's RFRA, Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And it's all about smoking a drug called peyote. As a matter of background information, peyote is not a fun drug. Peyote is a drug that is taken um, in religious ceremonies for certain Native American tribes. Um, as part of the requirements for certain uh, ceremonies. It gives you hallucinations, it makes you see things. Uh, some people believe it brings you to kind of a higher plane of existence. It also can make you violently ill. Uh, so this is not something you would take for fun, and it just happens to, as the side effect, bring you closer to a higher uh, calling. It takes you to a higher calling and then leaves you feeling pretty bad. So people taking peyote are really not doing it for uh, purposes other than religious purposes. And this also, like Sherbert, involves unemployment benefits. So we had uh, two individuals, I believe, uh, who got fired from their jobs for testing positive for peyote. So they had a random drug test, got tested, they tested positive, got fired. They applied for unemployment benefits and got denied unemployment benefits. And they got denied unemployment benefits because they got fired for cause. In other words, they got fired for a good purpose. If you uh, get fired and the employer is really in the right uh, and you're in the wrong, the government is not going to give you benefits for that. Uh, so don't go knocking over your boss's cubicle and expecting to get unemployment. Uh, not that I would know, but that does sound kind of fun. So uh, it sounds like something out of office space, right? So what uh, happened is that they applied for these benefits, got denied, and took the case to court, saying that denying them their benefits based on having engaged in a religious practice was an uh, infringement on their free exercise rights. This 
up until this point, seems to very much track the Sherbert case. Uh, so we should, in the end, see a decision in their favor, right? Uh, wrong. Uh, in, a, in a decision that was uh, heavily contested, especially in uh, the public, uh, Justice Scalia wrote that this was not uh, protected by the Free Exercise Clause of the Constitution. So the issue is whether the state can deny unemployment benefits to individuals who were terminated from their jobs for testing positive for opiates used during a religious ceremony. Generally, whether religious use of peyote is constitutionally protected. And they held that the state could deny such benefits. So, Scalia and the majority said, never has the court held that an individual's religious beliefs excuse him from compliance with an otherwise valid law prohibiting conduct that the state is free to regulate. In other words, if the state is free to regulate something uh, as criminal, drug use, murder, uh, burglary, etc., that you cannot claim a religious exemption from that. So that's how they distinguish Sherbert, uh, because this is, has to do with something engaging in criminal behavior, not just engaging in behavior that your employer doesn't like, i.e. refusing to work Saturdays. Uh, they distinguish Yoder and Cantwell and Pierce because they say there's no hybrid situation here. This doesn't involve the right to parent, like in Yoder. So it wasn't the kids challenging the law, it was the parents. And part of the court's reasoning was that the right to parent your children as you see fit is a fundamental right. This isn't a right to press or to free speech in some way, the way the Cantwell case can be interpreted. Uh, instead, what we are talking about here is a right to engage in an otherwise criminal activity. So the government is able to enforce generally applicable pro uh, prohibitions on action. And therefore, they could, in fact, enforce unemployment law uh, where someone had tested positive for opiates, they can disqualify them for benefits. So you can see the problem in this distinction. It makes sense that the government can prosecute people criminally for criminal acts and that a defense of religious beliefs may not uh, hold water there. But this isn't a criminal case. This is a civil case. This has to do with the denial of a benefit, not a criminal charge. So uh, people have long debated uh, this case, uh, and Congress got in on this debate as well. And in 1993, they quickly passed the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And the Religious Freedom Restoration Act was intended to combat the problems that Smith brought forward. In other words, Congress actually felt like, uh, like the Smith case should be overturned. And they got their law. And they got two prongs of the law. One is a stronger protection of free exercise with regard to federal government behavior. And the other prong of the law was a protection against state behavior. And the state behavior prong of the law was what was challenged in the city of Bourne v. Flores. This was a law that uh, was a neutral zoning law, and a historical church wanted to enlarge uh, its, um, its worship space. They were actually having people stand outside to try and get in during Mass, which is not a problem that Catholic churches usually have. But they needed to add on to be able to have people uh, attend Mass there, and the Zoning Commission would not let them because they had a historic building. They tried to put uh, roadblocks in their way from changing the zoning, from getting a permit for construction, etc. And the uh, church used the RFRA, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, to say that uh, this violated the free exercise of their religion because a neutral zoning law, uh, when applied to them, infringed on their religious practices. They couldn't have all of their uh, parishioners come in uh, 
for mass. So the court held, uh, interestingly, uh, they were not too pleased with what Congress had done here, and they held that the uh, RFRA could not be sustained as constitutional because Congress cannot rewrite the Constitution legislatively. It's different when, con when Congress reforms a law with regard to military dress, which is something they have wide berth to do. They can't change the Constitution without going through the rigorous constitutional amendment process, which is quite difficult and has only happened 27 times in history, uh, and really less than that because the Bill of uh, Rights was done all at once. So what the court says is that you can restrict yourself, Congress, from making laws that interfere with people's uh, religious beliefs. So the Religious Freedom Restoration Act of 1993, insofar as it deals with Congress, good, fine, you can limit yourselves. But insofar as it restricts the states from acting, no, that's unconstitutional, and they struck it down. Uh, as your book notes, they did end up getting their addition on the church after all, uh, but they had to go through this lengthy court process to do that. So, what we are at after the uh, Smith case, the Flores case, and uh, this is we have a federal RFRA. We also have, m in many states, state-level Religious Freedom Restoration Acts uh, that are intended on providing people uh, with protection from engaging in behaviors that would otherwise violate their religious beliefs. So Indiana had a large uh, publicity sort of fiasco uh, in the past year about, a, about their passage of their Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which uh, exempted people um, from having to serve uh, patrons who were, for example, um, not of a sexual orientation that they approved of. So if you came in asking for a wedding cake and the wedding cake said, um, and this is for some reason a wedding cake you're writing on because that's what people do these days, but if the wedding cake was for Dan and, and Stan as opposed to Dan and Sarah, uh, they could refuse you service because it was against their religious beliefs to engage in homosexuality. Uh, so there was a lot of uproar about that. They tried to mediate some of the effects of that law when it uh, after it got implemented. Uh, it's still a little bit up in the air. And every state RFRA is different. But this is what set off this idea that uh, people's religious freedom was being uh, somehow trampled. And what that has led to is things like the Hobby Lobby case in terms of federal governmental action. So many employees or more. And both of these entities do. Hobby Lobby, for example, has about 9,000 employees. So they're not small companies. Um, but whether that contraception mandate in the law um, could be pushed aside if it violated the owners of the companies closely uh, deeply held religious beliefs. And the reason why they were able to bring this claim is that both Hobby Lobby and Conestoga claimed successfully, ultimately, that they were closely held for-profit corporations, meaning that they don't sell stock. Um, the ownership is held largely within one family or entirely within one family, um, that there's not a large board, um, not many shareholders, etc. In other words, that the people that are making these decisions, if they are allowed to, are going to be from a very small group. Because the theory is, is that you are burdening their religious freedom if you require them under the Affordable Care Act to carry certain contraception um, under their health care plan. Ho Hobby Lobby was um, infamous for saying we don't want to um, burden our employees by not carrying all types of contraception under our health care plan, or not covering rather. Um, but instead, we want to be free from covering the contraception that we believe is um, akin to abortion. Now, their beliefs have no grounding in scientific knowledge.
um, if you ask a medical doctor or a scientist, whether things like Plan B, um, the morning after pill, or there's, there's other forms of emergency contraception, or the IUD, if those things are akin to abortions or what are called abortifacients, they would say no, they're not. They prevent pregnancy. They don't um, stop a viable pregnancy from happening. However, um, remember, these cases don't often get to the logic of the deeply held religious belief. They assume that there might not be logic, but it's still deeply held. So the question here is whether they could get out of those requirements. In other words, an otherwise neutral federal law. So the issue is whether closely held for-profit corporations can be exempt from otherwise neutral federal laws, here the Affordable Care Act's contraception mandate, if those laws place an undue burden on the free exercise rights of their owners. And the court in a 5-4 to four decision written by Justice Alito said they can. Yes, they can. Hobby Lobby and Conestoga can get out of providing those types of um, contraception that they feel violate their religious beliefs that it is wrong to take a life um, I am going to put up a couple of videos. One is from a very um, short-lived YouTube channel that Hobby Lobby um, had when the case was ongoing to sort of explain itself. Uh, and the other is John Oliver's take on the cases. Um, I'll let you come to your own conclusions, but needless to say, the Hobby Lobby case sets up some interesting precedent. If we take this case outside of the realm of the Affordable Care Act, when can a for-profit corporation decide to, that it is not going to comply with otherwise neutral federal law? You know, it's one thing when we were talking about the Smith case, individuals, um, but when we're talking about for-profit corporations like Hobby Lobby that have 9,000 plus employees and are in, you know, multitudes of states, that makes it a little bit different. So the free exercise clause has somewhat expanded in the past five years, and we'll probably see that trend continue um, as long as we see things like um, civil rights laws for LGBT persons be fought on freedom of religion grounds.